Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us this evening Jeffrey Hall, who's the vascular plant recorder for Leicestershire and Rutland, VC55. Uh, next week coming up, we have the annual uh, BSBI uh, New Year plant hunt. I believe it's the 10th year that that's run, possibly slightly different this year uh, due to COVID regulations, but going ahead. And I think Jeffrey's going to say something about that. And for those of us who are locked down and have been told today we can't go too far afield, uh, very appropriately, Jeffrey's going to talk about the joy of urban botany. So, uh, Jeffrey, uh, over to you. Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, this is a talk which I've give to, uh, I've given a couple of times before, and it's called The Joy of Urban Botany. Now, most people don't think urban sites are particularly interesting. Everyone wants to go out on the countryside and stand around in bogs and get wet and climb up mountains and fall off. Um, but urban botany is actually a lot less dangerous than standing in bogs and falling off mountains. It's also very interesting as well. Um, so um, I want to try to show you how, how, it, how you can find out a lot of things about botany just by looking around the urban environment and also uh, to show you some of the sort of habitats that you can find. It's not all bricks and mortar, though bricks and mortar are very interesting. So let's have a look at some plant diversity in, in Leicester and Rutland. Uh, this is a, a map of the number of species per tetrad. Now, for those of you who don't know, a tetrad is a two kilometre by two kilometre square. So that's a total area of four square kilometres. When we record plants, we go out and we look for the, uh, we find a tetrad and we try to record everything that we can find in there. And we, when we've got all the records together, we can plot them on a map. Now, this is a, a record of um, the last 20 years of uh, recording in Leicestershire. And it tells you the number of species per tetrad. Um, up on the top uh, right here is a, a little grid showing you the number of species per tetrad. I've color coded it to make it easy to understand. So um, blue is very, uh, has, has no um, records at all. These little tiny edge tetrads, little bits of tetrads that are in BC55. And it gets progressively hotter until we get to over 500. As you can see, there are actually three tetrads which have over 500 species recorded in the last 20 years. When we look at the picture of this, this uh, recording effort, and this is done by a lot of people, obviously, um, it, it's quite obvious there's a big area in the middle where all the high numbers of species per tetrad are. Um, and this is mostly Leicester City and down here through uh, into uh, Blaby and Enderby up here in Charmwood. There's a little bit of, of interest over here on the limestone over in Rutland, but this is really the, the biggest concentration of species in the county. So I want to have a, a little think about these species. Um, where did all these plants come from? And there, there's hundreds of them in some of those tetrads. Well, some of them are native, they've been here for a very long time, and others are introductions. Um, when we talk about introductions in botany, we, we consider archaeophytes. These are plants that arrived before 1500 and are, have been here for so long, we consider them to be part of the flora. They're all established and they can reproduce and uh, perpetuate their own populations. And there's other plants called neophytes, which arrived after 1500. Now, a lot of these are established as well, and they can uh, reproduce and produce their own populations, but we don't quite consider them part of the established British flora, not just yet anyway. Um, in more, more modern times, these plants have arrived um, via vehicle tires and railway lines and all sorts of other um, human intervention. Um, most recently, by, particularly by people feeding birds. And these uh, plants have quite, have quite a, a, a widespread distribution now. Also, there are escapes gardens and allotments and all sorts of planted trees and shrubs that we've put in as humans and the plants have decided they don't particularly want to stay where they are so they've up and uh, moved out of the garden or out of the allotment and they're now colonizing uh, streets and also moved out into the wider countryside. We also put in these wildflower strip uh, meadows and pollinator strips and these plants are now beginning to move out of these areas and into the wider countryside. So there's quite a lot 
quite a lot of places that uh, origins of these plants. And not, it's not all just one, one uh, or two different uh, sources. They come from a lot of different places. I want to look at a few of these now, just one or two in detail. This is a, a native plant, wall lettuce, uh, Mycelis muralis. Uh, in nature, nature, it lives in uh, shaded walls, rock outcrops and hedge banks, and in woodland wood margins in scrub. And if you go up into Wales or Scotland, you can find it in uh, various uh, mountain passes and you can find it on rocks. But here in Leicestershire, it is predominantly urban. Most of the records are from Leicester City. There's a couple here from Market Harbour, Kegworth, and this is the area around uh, Rutland Water, Uppingham, Medbourne, so Stamford. It's, it's very much an urban plant. It seems to like walls and the edges of pavements, and th these conditions maybe mimic its, its uh, environment na natively. It's quite an impossibly difficult plant to, to um, photograph, but here's a, a picture of it here, and there's the leaves. Another one is an archaeophyte, and this is something that arrived before 1500, and we consider it part of flora now. It's an annual dog's mercury, Mercurialis annua. It's known from Viking deposits, so it's been here a very, very long time. But in Leicester, it's nearly almost absolutely urban. You find it all in uh, uh, industrial estates, you can find it down the side of um, ha uh, housing estates, you can find it on shopping centres. So it's um, it's starting to increase. These are old records, these uh, sort of salmony pink um, squares. But I think the newer ones, which are the red ones, uh, show that it's actually beginning to increase a bit more. Why, we don't know. I mean, it could be the fact that it's able to persist more in the winter because winters are warmer now or maybe wetter and it's able to get a start. Don't know. So that's uh, another plant that you'll find. And here's some neophytes. These arrived after 1500. Uh, Eastern rocket, Cicimbrium orientale. Again, it's almost totally confined to uh, urban areas, Leicester, Loughborough, Melton, Hinkley, and a bit around Rutland Water. There's probably people coming in from these um, areas and bringing seeds in on their uh, car tires. Um, this is quite an interesting plant. It's a Mediterranean plant and it starts growing now. And if you go out along Vaughan Way or around the Ring Road in Leicester, you can see the plants that are just starting. And they start to grow very early because they're Mediterranean. They go through uh, March and by April it's flowering. Uh, by May it's produced its seed pod and by June it's gone. So this is a plant that you really need to record early in the year, in the first, first four or five months. And there is masses of it and around the Ring Road in Leicester, particularly in the cracks of the pavements in the centre reservations. Um, it's quite easily recognised by these very, very long pods, which um, hang off at 90 degrees from the uh, main axis. Um, it's a member of the cabbage family, and um, it, I think it's a very attractive plant, but again, it does brighten up the winter. And it's been known in the wild, whatever that is, uh, since 1859. Um, of course, there are other planted trees and shrubs which people put in for landscaping and a lot of these produce seeds which birds like and they eat them and then fly away and deposit them somewhere else. And this is a Cotoniaster species which is becoming established in some light woodland um, off Bath Street silt dump in the north uh, west of Leicester. I think this one is probably Simonsia. Uh, it's a bit too small to identify need flowers and fruits because only is a very difficult group to identify so I didn't identify it at the time but it's it's um, particularly invasive in Wales in woodland there it's really uh, in, I've seen it just forming almost an entire understory of uh, plant um, this is one of the plants which I think which probably be, we need to be on our eye, uh, lookout for it really it really will start to take off I think with a, in the next few years And garden escapes. <coughs> uh, this is in St Mary's Army in Bronson. It's a red hot poker, <coughs> which is seeded from somebody's garden. And it's growing quite well on the corner of the road there. It's coping very well with the beer can and the plastic rubbish. And uh, it's getting all its new. It's uh, from South Africa. It's got uh, a xerophytic plant. If it's wintergreen, um, it's 
it, it is hardy in this country, but very hard frosts can kill them. Um, it's getting its roots down, getting all its nutrients from the back of the pavement. So these are another group of plants which um, we find in the urban flora. This was only the second county record. Um, I don't, the people who did the last flora weren't particularly interested in aliens much and they didn't record them. Um, and in the recent years, we've become much more interested in these because really of the spread. Um, in the past, they were, they were sort of more oddities and curiosities, but now um, they're becoming much, much more widespread. And it's more interesting to find out why are they becoming widespread? Uh, where are they living? How are they living there? What, are we creating conditions for these plants to live? Is it climate change? Is it a bit of both? Who knows? But that's why we're recording them now, because they are very interesting now, uh, much more than they were to, to botanists in the past, I think. So let's have a quick look at this diversity that I spoke about in the first slide. Um, this is a, a sort of zoomed in portion of the first slide. Um, and this blue square here uh, refers to more or less Leicester City. Um, now, if we look at all species, um, we've got some very high numbers there, uh, 500s, just a five, uh, lots of 400s and 300s species per tetrad, this is. Um, but let's just have a look at um, the, the, nat the natives and archaeophytes. These are the plants which we would consider to be part of the British flora. And if we look at those alone, we still got very high numbers. Now that sort of gives, gives the boot to the idea that everything that's growing in the city is a, an introduced thing or it's come out of a garden or it's, it's not very exciting um, because there are lots of native plants in here and I think the reason why you get a lot of native plants is because they're not sprayed with herbicide and they've got low nutrients in lots of places so they can compete uh, which they can't really do out in the countryside because of the high nitrogen status and the continual spraying with herbicides so you tend to find a lot of plants that you would find in meadows actually in the city growing. There's plants like um, Veronica Polita, Greyfield Speedwell. You can find easily in urban areas, but it, it is rare as hen's teeth when you go looking around field margins for it. You just can't find it. So there's a couple of areas in this um, distribution that are quite interesting to me. This is the River Saw Corridor, uh, coming up from the south, going out to the north. And this has got a, a very large number of species. Um, the river saw through the centre of Leicester really is a gem. It's the corridor there has so many interesting um, plants to look at that it, it's one of the botanical gems of the city. Um, this, uh, uh, the other area is this one here, this square here, which has got 424 natives, that's Alston Meadows. So again, this this saw corridor is a fantastic uh, jewel in the botanical crown of Leicester City. And something which we should really, really cherish. And there are one or two anom anomalies here. This square here is my home square, which is where Russell lives. That's probably recorded to death, which is why it's an awful lot of species. And this up here is Charmwood Forest, which again is very, um, very species rich. But certainly this, this lovely saw corridor is something which we, we need to cherish. So why, why are these urban sites so species rich? I mean, is it better access or are there more recorders out there looking at them? Or are there more sources of plants um, compared with you know, the countryside where we think plants, there are a lot of plants? Or maybe it's, there's more place, places for plants to live. So I'm gonna quickly look at some of these. Uh, okay. Jeffrey, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. Your sound is coming and going a little bit. Um, would, would you like to try just turning your video off and seeing if that improves it? Yeah. And get your slides back. Let's turn the video off. Yeah, you, you know, your, your, your picture of your face. Oh, right. But, but then just share the slides. Okay. Uh, that, that might improve the sound quality because we keep losing you. Okay. That's it. Great. Thanks. That yeah, let's try that. Okay, so 
I'll just recap then, see if you can hear this. Uh, why are the urban site species rich? Is it better access or there's more recorders or there's more sources of plants compared with the countryside? Or is it there are more spaces for plants to live? So I'm going to look at uh, these uh, propositions now. Um, just looking at one tetrad, uh, SK50L, which is in Braunston town, and it looks like this. This is the typical urban tetrad. Uh, a lot of uh, roads, major roads, housing, and a bit of green space. Now, think about it, of course, it has massively good access. Uh, you can go down all these uh, streets, all along all the roads. The park is open to everyone. Um, you can look around the edge of the park and ride. You can go through Maynard's Gorse. You can look through Foxhole Spinney. Uh, there's, so there is a lot of access, and that is quite different to the countryside. Often you find that you're limited to edges of roads or public footpaths, and necessarily your recording effort is reduced. Um, whereas in uh, uh, an urban area, you can get uh, a lot of records, and but of course the converse, they do take a long time to do. Um, some of these tetrads will take five to six visits of three to four hours a time, so it can take a very very long time to get some of these done. Um, what about the number of recorders? Well, there are there were 17 recorders in this tetrad in the last 20 years. Um, I've got on this little table the numbers of the individual um, recorders, but I've just used their uh, initials because I can't put their names on. And as you can see, <clears throat> there were there are 17 recorders, but only five of the recorders had more than 10 records. Um, these ones down the bottom here. <clears throat> and of those, two of them were the, the VC55 recorders, two of them were Leicestershire, the Leicester City Council staff, and only one was a local naturalist. So most of the recording effort in this tetrad has been done by, by the, the recorders and the county, uh, the city council staff. So it also it tells you that this is not a place where many recorders will go. Um, compared with, say, you know, Bredgate Park or any of the Wildlife Trust reserves, many, many people will go to those, and I get thousands of records a year from, from good sites like that, but people don't go to here, which is a shame, really, because there's a lot to see. Um, now, let's think about the sources of plants in here. They're obviously wild plants. Um, some of these uh, occur in here in Braunston Meadows, which is a very old piece of grassland. Um, they've probably been there for a very, very long time. Um, with some of the archaeophytes that you can find here, um, there's plenty of roads to bring uh, where, where vehicles can bring plants in on their tyres. Um, there's down here was a huge landscaped area where a lot of soil, soil was imported and it's been brought in, and there's some quite interesting plants down there. Um, there's some allotment gardens down here um, from which plants escape. There's plenty of uh, private gardens uh, where plants can escape from. And there are a lot of planted trees and industrial estate. Um, there's an industrial estate up here. At Main, uh, this is just part of um, Bromston Frith. And there's um, a, plant, a, a big school here which has got a lot of planted areas. There's some planted areas up around here on this area of the uh, Bronston Park as well. So there's plenty of, of sources of plants, many, many more than perhaps you'd find in the countryside, where you're limited to woodland and hedgerow and meadows and some streams. Of course, there's also um, a, a couple of lakes here and, a, and a, a, nat a native stream as well. Right. Now, think about this habitat, this, this tetra lot of different types of habitat, streets, grassland and so on, hedgerows and woodland and some of the most diverse areas are grasslands and streets. Now you wouldn't have thought that really when you look at it you think oh you know this is a an urban tetrad, why it's going to be all you know bricks and building and roads but no there's a lot of little parcels of land in a, an urban area, some of them not so little either where plants can grow and where plants have established themselves. So there's some verges. Uh, this example of verges and recent planting. This is Gooding Avenue with its very, very wide verges. Um, 
we tend to find that verges in older estates are species rich as well. Um, they seem to be really bits of old meadow that have survived um, from the long distant past. This is a, a, a new area which has been created off Vitruvius Way and has some new planting and some recent grassland. This is some quite old grassland in, in Gonston Park. Very, very nice grassland if we go up there in the summer. Um, And here is uh, the, some parkland in um, very nice trees in Braunston Park. There's some quite unusual exotics have been introduced there, um, such as uh, uh, puke pine from, uh, uh, and there's some very interesting limes there as well. Uh, then we've got some mesotrophic grassland near St Peter's Church. Now mesotrophic means that it's it's moderately rich and it's um, the sort of grassland you find in Britain uh, in uh, areas of clay or neutral soil. So uh, there's some quite good uh, flower, f uh, flowers that appear there in the, in the summer. And just down from the uh, mesotrophic grass, I need a bit of marshy grassland, which is perpetually wet. We have a few uh, wet loving species there. Got the water courses, this is the stream. I mean, this actually looks like something out of, you know, photograph you know you wouldn't think this is right in the middle of the city would you but this is the the stream in the in the spring and here's a nice big brook uh, brook and covered at lovisthorpe and uh, this is some um, um this is great, some lesser celandine uh, ficaria verna growing on the bank here in the spring you also got some industrial sites off the Druvius way and uh this is I, I was entranced by this little picture this little plant here this area was being completely bulldozed and demolished and there were a massive amount of earthworks going on here. Yet on the edge, there was this little strip of grassland and this little primrose had decided that it was going to hang on in there and flower. And it's just such a lovely picture of this one, this plant sort of, um, you know, hanging in there and fighting against adversity and fighting against this onslaught. And uh, it was actually behind a, uh, chain link fencing, but I managed to get my hand on my phone in and get a picture of it. You know, and it's a, it's a sort of example of, of how plants hang on in, in urban areas. Got some very nice old hedgerows in Fox and Way. These are quite species rich. And Ramnus catartica in this, that's purging blackthorn. There's some de deciduous woodland at Maynell's Gorse. This is nice. Is open to the public you can walk through that and if there is a, a, a local group that looks after it as well and clears all the litter out and certainly worth a trip in the spring if you're up in that area you've got lakes this is the lake in uh, the pool in Braunston, which again has more some more aquatic marginal flora and housing um, most people think this is awful but there's lots and lots of little plants along in these cracks uh, along the edge of the pavement in the edge of the concrete and in the verges here and some of these you won't find anywhere else except along here they need uh, re regular disturbance and really poor soil very low nutrients and this is about the only place they'll grow so in all um, in five visits about 24 hours work in 2016 i recorded 336 species in that tetrad the total now is uh 360 and there's only 87 not recorded since 2000. So this is a really species rich area. Um, uh, compared with some of the, you know, the agricultural tech trans we go to, um, which have, you know, you struggle to get 120 species. And when you've been in there three or four tires, you know, you've been all over it and you can't find anything. You know, the, 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 this has got, uh, you know, three times what you'd find in a lot of uh, agricultural tech trans. So why are these sites richer? Well, first of all, I said it was better access. Well, that's, that's true. You can get in to see these and you can see a lot more. Is it more recorders? I don't think so. Um, we've probably got more recorders doing the major parts of the countryside than we have in urban areas. There's not many people of us, not many of us do it. Um, so I don't think that's a particularly uh, a, a, a feature which uh, would, would favour these, these high results. More sources of plants, yes, there probably are. Um, there's more vehicular traffic, uh, 
people go to work all over the country they bring seeds back on their cars um so yes i think there's a there's a, a there's more sources of plants and certainly more ways of getting plants into these areas but most importantly there are more places for plants to live the range of habitats you've got in these areas is substantially greater than you have in the countryside um, and that and they're also low nutrients as i've said and there's no herbicide so you can really so these plants can get uh, going and they can thrive and compete so uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the public urban habitats and look at a few of these now. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, pavements, roadsides, buildings, brownfield estates, industrial estates, uh, parks, churchyards and water bodies. But I'm not going to talk about allotment gardens or gardens or railways because they're not public accessible, they're all private. So I'm just going to stick to the ones that are, that are publicly accessible. Let's have a quick look at pavement and roadsides. Um, this is a typical tree base. Uh, it's got a lot of uh, interesting plants growing around the edge of, the, around the base of the tree. There's some more Mycelis muralis and there's Lapsana communis and all sorts of things flowering there. And the, the cracks in these pavements provide um, water, nutrients and shelter for the seeds. And they also um, protect them from trampling. However, they are subject to herbicides. The council do seem to like putting herbicides down, uh, although it was a lot less this year. And uh, certainly in the first few months of lockdown, some of the um, road uh, edges, uh, road, road, road sides, and road verges around where I live just blossomed into uh, the most wonderful display of flowers because they hadn't been killed off this year. <clears throat> this is along London Road. There's some massive amounts of uh, Oxford ragwort, which escaped from the Oxford, uh, Oxford University Botanic Garden in the, <coughs> excuse me, the 18th century. And its home is on Mount Vesuvius in uh, Italy, and it likes a uh, very low nutrient uh, habitat, and it uh, prefers uh, the um, urban environment because of the, the heat island effect. Urban areas tend to be a lot warmer than the countryside. And also it tends to go against walls which absorb heat. So it's, it's a bit of a thermophile and we can find it usually in the, in the center of the city, often in great abundance. It seeds very well and it's certainly taken to Leicester. And there's some buddleia there, um, which is probably the commonest lowland shrub now. I'm reliably informed by one or two people in the BSBI. It's, uh, 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 a native of, of Central Asia, but it's uh, moved into Britain a long, long time ago. Uh, it seeds prolifically. Seeds are supposed to keep um, lots of small birds alive during the winter. Um, and it will grow, as we know anyway, you can see a very nice piece of it at the moment poking out of the tower on the clock at the Leicester City Railway Station, which wasn't removed during the re recent renovation. Our uh, tarmac, well, that's no problem to lots of plants. Here we are in the Meridian Business Park. And there's some colt's foot, Tassilago fathara, and it's pushed its way up out through the uh, tarmac and it's flowering away really well. Um, colt's foot is a, a really a pioneer species. It, it comes in very quickly when areas, uh, particularly industrial areas, are uh, exposed and it will grow very quickly, but it doesn't last a long time. Um, it lasts a fair, fair, a fair few, a few years and it'll gradually be overgrown. Um, but it's, a, it's a, a really good pioneer plant and very tough to force its way up through tarmac there. The spring beauty, uh, another introduced plant from North America, uh, which uh, grows in Regent Road in Leicester. You can also find it around the Botanic Garden in uh, some of the roads around there where it's escaped from the gardens. And uh, it grows profusely in the spring um, through um, February, March and April, and then by June it's all gone. Another interesting little plant is the small nettle, Etica urens. It uh, looks a bit like the uh, nettle, we all, nettle we all come to love or hate. Um, love it if you're a butterfly or moth person, hate it if you're a, a gardener. Um, but this is a slightly different plant, it's an annual. Uh, you can find it quite often around the bases of trees in the city. It's a, it's a nitrified, it likes lots of nitrogen, 
So it grows uh, around the tree bases in what um, botanists know as the dog zone. So this is the area of high nitrogen deposition. So obviously you're gonna get plants that really like the high nitrogen in there. So this is, uh, this is around uh, in high fields, you can find quite a lot of these. Great Parsons, uh, this is in Narborough Road at Foss Park. It's growing the edge of the path there. It's miles from anywhere where there, are, uh, there is another uh, muscari. So I don't know how it got there, but it did. And it's starting, not only is it flowering, but as you can see here, it's actually starting to spread. These long leaves here all belong to this muscari. Um, I found it once or twice out in the countryside in hedgerows and it's it's starting to be uh, more common. Uh, it's, a, it's introduced plant from the Mediterranean, but it's starting to become more common now, and I think it's starting to spread. I spoke uh, a couple of years ago to Martin Rand, who's a recorder for South Hampshire, and he says that uh, in certain parts of Hampshire there are hedgerows where there are tens of yards of it now, which all grow in the hedgerow. I think it's probably occupying the same niche as um, bluebells did in the past, but we cleared all those out and they've gone and now the muscari is coming in. So this is quite an interesting plant you can find, along with the tree mallow, <coughs> which I found, Malva arborea in Thurcaston Road. I think this has come in with lorries. There's a lot of construction activity going on there um, at Ashton Green. And I think some of the, the lorries have come in from the seaside and they've bought seeds of this with them, or maybe it's coming with the or soil or building material, building sand particularly that they use. And uh, it's managed to grow and escape. And there are uh, several of these plants down there. They're really rather handsome. This is about three, this is about a metre, at least a metre tall. And they're, they're certainly well naturalised there. I've seen about half a dozen now. And uh, they are starting to spread. That's a nice addition. Uh, a seaside plant for the, for the county. Uh, this is Evington Lane. And there's some ladies' bed straw on the edge of the uh, verges there. I think I said earlier, a lot of the road verges, particularly in the States, um, have a lot of meadow flower, flora in them. The older estates, the ones in the 1930s, tend to be the best. You find these are the more species rich. The, the estates from the 70s onwards tend to be mostly just ryegrass and clover and a few dandelions, maybe a, the old daisy but the older ones seem to be carved out of old bits of meadow. And I wonder whether they just put plonked the housing estates on top of the meadows and just left the meadows as the verges. Um, they're getting a bit thin, these populations, obviously now, because they're not looked after, but you, the best place to look for them is right on the edge of the curb here, um, by, by the side. Obviously, you've got to be careful you don't get run over. Um, but you do find that they form a nice edge here, I think, again, because it's slightly more nutrient poor and it's not mown so much. Um, they managed to escape the, uh, the, the mower blades at this point. <coughs> Top of main verges, I think a few of you will be aware of these. These are a fantastic old uh, strip of meadow land in the city. You can find pepper saxifrage there. That's a, a meadow, uh, a, a beautiful old meadow plant. You can find dropwort, betony, and meadow saxifrage. Um, they're not in abundance, you have to go and look for them, but they're still there. And again, this is a, a fantastic glory of the city of Leicester to have all of these in this one strip bordering Saffron Lane. Um, it's getting a bit overgrown now, maybe a little needs a bit of maintenance and thinning. These trees up here are starting to come forward. Well, there's this bridge here, the, the railway bridge, the Bettany is just around here by the railway bridge. And the, the saffron, the, the meadow saxifrage is up by the garage at the, uh, the northern end of the, uh, the lane. And there's some very nice meadow plants in there. Under into rare plants, this is musk stalksbill, Rhodium muscatum, which is growing at Foss Park. Um, you have to sort of, uh, you have to go across uh, out of the, the, um, park, out of the shopping centre, along some of the pedestrian uh, access roads. And then you can find this at a crossroads. And there's it's a massive stand of this. This is a plant that um, is actually starting to move up from the south coast. It's where it, it's a, it's a native of um, 
south coast, um, particularly uh, Devon, Cornwall, Dorset, Hampshire, but it is starting to move up. And uh, we're not, nobody's quite sure why, how it's coming up. It's probably coming up with um, uh, vehicles, particularly construction vehicles, um, but the, it's managing to settle in. And it's called, the thing I find interesting about this is it's managed to colonize a huge area of this corner of this, this road. And it competes quite well with all the grass there. So it's managing to, to compete in, in what, is, what you would think would be actually a quite hard, hard and difficult environment. Um, it seems to be quite resistant to the mowing. It's still there, there's a lot of it there. And you can see it um, uh, when you go up there still. Um, I just found this, this was extraordinary, knotted hedge parsley. It's a plant which we normally expect to grow over in the far east. So it's much more common in, in Rutland on the border of Lincolnshire and down in Northamptonshire and limestone. And there's quite a lot of it there, it's quite uh, easy to find. So I was quite, extraordinary, I was quite surprised to find a, a, a load of it, I mean, along the edge of a, a suburban lawn, and then later in some verges in Newton Lane in Wigston. Not where I'd expect to find it at all. Um, in fact, I was photographing it and I was so excited I dropped my iPhone and broke the screen. So um, that little plant cost me about £110 to get a new screen. But it was worth it, I think. And it's still there and it's flowering away. The flowers there occur in, in knots, uh, hence its name, knotted hedge parsley. Uh, again, no idea how it got there, but it's certainly spreading around and it's starting to move along the edges of the pavement, in the cracks, on the edge, and also on the verge. Uh, winter road sorting, that's certainly changed in the distributions. Um, I found um, in the centre of the dual carriageway in Lubbersthorpe Way in Leicester is a sort of place where uh, only, only the insane and, and a botanist would dream of going. But um, when I went there, um, I found this plant, which is sea pearlwort. It's a coastal species. And it had completely colonised a huge swathe, about 10, 15, 20 yards of the central reservation. And it is uh, there with its other coastal friend, uh, Cochlearia danica, Danish scurvy grass. And if, for, for these plants, it's just like being on the coast. It's salted uh, during the winter. So they can, these plants are ha uh, halophilic and they, or halotolerant and they can, they can cope with the salt and it's dry and it's poor soil it's rocky it's just like being at home really so they've uh, they've got lots of very light easily dispersed seeds they're annuals and they grow produce lots of seed seed stays on the top um, they disappear for the summer and they start growing again in the late autumn uh, and grow through the winter so these are a couple of uh, coastal plants which are growing uh, in the center um, this is one of the major changes, I think, in the flora of Leicester since the, and Leicestershire since the last floor was published in 1988. Uh, the number of um, inland records we now have of uh, coastal plants in the county is, is extraordinary. In the, I think in the last flora in 1988, there were only four records of Cochlearia danica, just four, and they're all on ballast on railways. I think I must be up to about four or five hundred tetrads now uh, with this uh, plant it's just just everywhere and there are, you know tens of yards of it along the sides of the roads in the in the spring uh, another one is the buxhorn plantain um plantago coronopus this is in uh, bristol uh, is a, a wonderful hobby stop in the car and stuck in the traffic down and look out and see what's in the verge and uh, when you do that, you'll see uh, a lot. A lot of times in the city, you'll see uh, this plant here, another coastal species. Uh, again, very much a, an urban distribution here: Loughborough, Ashby, Melton, Leicester. And this is growing on the A5 here. <coughs> um, so next time you, you stopped at the, the crossroad, have a look at the window, see if you can see that. There's quite a lot of it um, in Oadby on, on the A6. And um, I was looking at uh, Florence Ragway in Oadby and I found a salting bin here. I thought, oh, what's something growing on the front of that? And I looked very carefully, it was this plant, it was Lesser Sea Spurry, Spaganaria marina. Yet another coastal plant which has moved its way inland. And in some areas you can find 
you know, yards and yards of this. Another annual produce lots of seed. They lodge in the sides of the road and they grow very well. And produce a lovely uh, display of pink flowers in midsummer. Uh, again, benefiting from all the winter road sorting. <coughs> That's a quick look at walls. Um, walls are quite often colonised by ferns. Um, they, the, the, the bricks themselves are usually acid, can be acidic or neutral, but the mortar is always alkaline. So we tend to get the plant, plants that like uh, alkaline rocks in nature. Um, they, they grow very uh, easily on these habitats and they trap moisture and nutrients. And of course they provide a habitat for invertebrates. This is in the <coughs> Great Central Way in Aylston. And you can see the wall root here. That should be Ruta, Aspenium Ruta, Marat, Ruta Moralis. And this is Hart's Tongue Fern, Aspenium Scolopendrium. And there's also Black Spenium, Aspenium adiantum nigrum. So there's three different ferns growing on the Great Central Way at Elston. Uh, walls. Here's uh, ivy leaf toad flax growing on the Grand Union Canal at Frog Island. Uh, it's growing, uh, it normally grows in, in, in villages on walls, um, but here it's growing on the ground uh, along the, the edge of the wall by the uh, pavement. And out in the countryside, less common, so less so in the city, but you can still find it. it produces a lot of really nice flowers, and uh, in the spring and early summer. Some wallflowers um, at Abbey Park uh, in uh, that's a park, city park ruins. Um, these are records that were on the recording card for uh, the previous flora, but hadn't been seen since 1979. Um, so I thought, well, the only one place I can think of in the city where I would be able to find these uh, would be in, in Abbey Park. And lo and behold, they were all over the ruins, just that they'd been there for years, but nobody recorded them. Okay, this Hartstung Fern, the Spelium Scolopendrium, uh, the Great Central Way in Aylston. Uh, it's really colonised that, that blue brick bridge really well. Um, that's just at the very top end, the north end of... Uh, and buildings. Um, this was a very tricky photograph to get. This is the uh, visitor's entrance to Leicester Prison. And at the top of that, there's a lot of these little daisy-like plants growing all over it. Uh, this is a plant called Mexican flea brain, Erigerin carvinskianus. Um, and it's uh, from South America and it escapes from gardens. And you can often it, it, you find it in urban areas. Again, it's, it likes a little bit of heat and it certainly colonised this area. In the countryside, you find it often on, on walls of churches or um, in, in gardens, but it's much more common in urban areas. And here it's growing very well. The uh, prison service had actually repaired all the walls of the prison, and I was a bit worried that they would remove all of this, but they managed to leave all this, and it's still there. It certainly was the last time I looked. So if you fancy going to have a look, um, it's still there. But I'd just like to say there is a a security camera there, so be careful if you take any photographs. Right, brownfield sites. And these are some development sites. This is one at Exploration Drive. Uh, these are fantastic hunting grounds for plants because they're usually low nutrient and they have uh, a lot of uh, open bare soil, which allows early colonizers to come in. One of the interesting plants you find here is a hare's foot clover, Trifolium arvensi. It's very common in um, uh, open, uh, poor nutrients. The problem with this one is that quite a lot of this has been built over now, um, and this is all the problem with development sites. Even though they've got lots of really interesting plants on them, they uh, disappear very quickly. We also have a couple of rare plants. We found some corn chamomile and some corn marigold. I suspect these had come in as uh, bird seed food, but they're still there. Um, we don't know. I mean, maybe they've been there for a long time and been disturbed, but I think birdseed is probably the, the more plausible. 
Home flowers galore. This was a lovely area um, in Abbey Park Road by the old bus station before I just after it was pulled down. Um, quite a lot of this has disappeared now under housing. This was an absolutely glorious border. Um, it's like having a you know herbaceous border. You've got some ver verbatim there, buddleia, um, lots of uh, geraniums here, um, and of course these are fantastic nectar sources for uh, birds and bees. And uh, it, it was a shame really to see this go. I, I I really enjoyed looking at this. It was here for about five or six years. And every year there were more and more and more plants appeared, but nobody had sown these, they just arrived. Um, and you think, well, you could, you could spend hundreds of pounds trying to create a border like that, and you'd never get it to look, look as good. But the plants still arrived, and they didn't, they, they, they came from, uh, the, I think, most of this derelict area at the back. There's another area, this is in Centurion Way in Blaby. Um, this was an odd site. Um, it's open, but I think it's clay capped. So it's quite, you get uh, little pools here that's developing and it's quite uh, sort of wet, uh, it's quite wet to walk over, uh, hence all these, these rushes. But um, there wasn't very much growing there. So I don't know what sort of clay it was. This green here is mostly a bit of grass and a lot of moss. This is a lot of Ratidia Adolphus, I think this was. Um, that was quite, an uninspiring site and we thought, oh, there's not going to be much here. Um, doesn't look very good until we found uh, these. There is about, oh, I don't know, several thousand uh, grass at one point. This is actually quite an unusual plant in Nashville and Rutland. Um, it, it's a hemiparasite. And uh, to see them in that number was quite unusual. When we do find them in the county, they tend to be in small numbers. Um, but here, I think probably because again it's poor soil and a lot of uh, uh, plants there which uh, it could uh, use as a host, it had spread massively. And we also found uh, 13 pyramidal orchids in flower. This is a plant which is again increasing in the county, I think. It's coming up from the south. Orchid seeds are very light and easily dispersed by the wind. And, then, and it's starting to grow, it's starting to move about the county. We've got Quite a, a significant increase in this in the county now. And also there's a little spike sedge here. This is Carex spicata. Again, it's a plant of um, more open conditions. Um, you can often find it on roadsides. Uh, industrial housing estates. Um, this is in Bronson Frith. We found the green speedwell, which is a, not used to be found on the field edges, but you can't find it now because it's been sprayed out. Cut leaf dead nettle, um, which we do find very infrequently in the countryside, but much, much more in urban situations. And we leaf saxifrage, uh, Cyber tridactylites. Uh, if you go to Derbyshire, you can find this all over the uh, rocks uh, in various uh, dales in Derbyshire. But if you want to see a really good display in Leicester, then go to Parker's Car Park at uh, 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 I think Parker's Car Park, it's by the, the bottom of uh, Milton Road. And there are tens of thousands which grow on their four car, uh, car, car showroom uh, forecourt. Uh, and they form a fantastic display in the spring. You can also find it in the old Abbey Road bus station. And even here in Bronston Frith, there, was, there were tens of yards of it. It starts to flower very early. Um, the best displays are in March or April. Outside the county, the best place to go to see it is on the tops of walls in villages. But here it's in, present in massive numbers. It, it obviously likes a little extra warmth, it gets going early and it produces a lot of seed and persists. It's usually gone and invisible by July and August um, and it will, will just be starting to grow now. Some bear natives, I found this, this is Flixweed, Descarania sophia. It's outside New Park's library and shops. Um, the, the council have been doing some work putting in an access ramp to the library. I don't know who they got to um, do the work, but um, maybe they brought some soil in from outside. This plant is actually 
really restricted to the east of England. Um, Norfolk, Suffolk is a, a good place to get to Cambridgeshire um, and bits of Lincolnshire, but mainly over in the east. It's not a, 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 it's not a native of Leicestershire, so it's come in from somewhere. So I thought, well, you know, it, it's probably the building work. And it, but then I I walked down the road to the shops and I found it growing in all these flower borders in all the rose beds there. So I don't quite know where this has come from. Maybe it had come in earlier than and was just persisting there. Or maybe it was in the flower beds and then moved up into this area when it, when it was soil was disturbed. But that was quite a quite an interesting plant. It's a member of the cabbage family, uh, crucif uh, a brassicae, old crucifery. But this is the only one in Britain which has these lovely, finely divided, very pinnate leaves. Valians, when we're up at Ashton Green, Benny and Paul's, we find a Balkan spur, actually, for the oblongata. This has been marching through Britain uh, at the moment. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's from its name, it's from the Balkans, and it uh, has, it's, it's a perennial and it establishes itself really well. Um, it, on Benny and Paul's, there are uh, several yards of it uh, growing on one of the banks there. And you can find it back, uh, further back um, at the Aston Green Bakery and at several other sites in the city. Um, it produces lots of very, very hard seeds, which I think are quite easily dispersed. And uh, it's, it's one of the plants that's, that's started to become a bit invasive. But it's still very attractive, and uh, you can see it along on the side of the road there. Russell Hall Country Park has some interesting trees there, uh, and some new, newly planted um, areas. Also Knighton Park. Um, and if you go down to Bronston Park, you see the, the very nice grassland there, which I was talking about, which has pig nut, um, agrimony, and pepper saxifrage again. So there's another site for pepper saxifrage in the city. Um, these old pieces of grassland in the parks are all easily accessible. And they're certainly worth this uh, grassland of Bronston Park is certainly worth a, a visit in the spring and early summer. There are, I think, about four sites now for uh, pepper saxophage in the city, but this, in this site, um, there's quite a few of them. Um, the management doesn't quite favour it. Um, the management, it, it's mown a bit too early, just before the pepper saxophage sets seed. I think some years it manages to survive um, mowing and it, and it um, uh, seeds but uh, a lot of the time it's mown just a little bit too early. But it's, it's a big residential area and have to balance up the, uh, the needs of the residents and the, the management of the grassland. In the spring, you can find absolutely masses of pig nut in there. Uh, it is just all over the place. And uh, there's some very nice stands of... Uh, Churchyards, wonderful places. This is um, Welford Road Cemetery. Recorded 205 species. Lots of planted plant, uh, primroses, which escape from, from graves and are now naturalised. Um, um, this is Boissier's Glory of the Slow, um, Scylla luculii, which has um, spread out from a grave and has now carpeted this area here. Um, at the side here, there's a path, and it's actually managed to get across the path into the grassland on the other side. Uh, which is next to the railway bank. It's gone through the fence and down the railway bank. So soon that railway bank is going to be a, a huge mass of blue skillers uh, early in the season. Uh, so if you're travelling by uh, train, you'll be able to see this, this wonderful blue slick of, of, of skiller laculei as you go uh, down to London. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a... a it's kind of a, it's a nice plant. It's nice to see that one growing there. Um, here's some more natives. This is the oxide daisy growing in all the graves. This is up in the old Victorian park, which is the interesting part. And you can see here, there's a little bit of um, ladies' bed straw, which here has grown up and in uh, a funeral <coughs> and on a grave. And there's a, a lot of very interesting old grassland plants in Welford Road Cemetery. Um, this is just a couple that I've shown here, but if you go rootling around, you can find a lot more. If you've ever got, if you're in, in town or 
you haven't got you've got a couple of hours to spare do have a look around the cemetery it is really good for, for species and again it's one of the the jewels in the crown of leicester's botany water bodies Grand Union Canal, we know, is good. This is a, a view just um, near the uh, Walker Stadium. Stadium over here, the football stadium. And uh, uh, obviously you've got a lot of aquatic uh, plants, uh, marginal plants. The uh, channels itself are fairly clear um, by the boat track. Margins, particularly by this uh, bridge here, the right old railway bridge, are, are very good. And some things you can find are the skull cap, which you uh, find actually easiest on the brick uh, walls of the canal, it flowers and grows in the, the mortar. The sweet flag, which is uh, not too common on there, but you can find it search if you search it out a bit. It's a native of um, North America, it was introduced a couple of hundred years ago. And it's, uh, it's in predominantly more uh, still water uh, rather than uh, running water. And if you snap the leaves, they smell of tangerines. There's a lot of the yellow water lily. I found quite a lot of pink water speedwell on the weir. It's growing out of the, the brickwork. And arrowhead on the edges. Arrowhead tends to get a lot of uh, a bit trashed by the canal boats, but um, in areas where there's not too much disturbance, it will flower and produce these lovely white flowers later in the year. And the other thing we have in, in the uh, canal there is this stonewort, Nitella mucronata variety gracilima. It's actually nationally scarce. You can put the various points in the, the, the Grand Union Canal in the city, you can put your hand in and pull out handfuls of it. So it's obviously having a good time in Leicester, you know, it's not doing very well in the rest of the country. Um, I found it in a new hectare this year, uh, well, sorry, Russell found it in a new hectare this year, and uh, it's a, a bit further south um, towards uh, Stan Elston Mill Lock. Um, these are very old, they're very um, ancient plants, they are a very large type of alga, so they're not a flowering plant, but they're an aquatic alga, and they um, are winter green, so you can look for these all year. Um, they don't disappear. So if you wanted to find this, you could probably go and have a look uh, tomorrow or next few days, and you'll find it somewhere in the canal. Um, reading here we are on Western Boulevard, and this is uh, some grasses that have sprung up after some people have been feeding the ducks. And uh, what have we got? Well, we've got hairy finger grass, which is down here. We've got green bristle grass. We've got maize. Coxspur, which is going off the edge here. Oh, too far. So we've got four uh, alien grasses there, uh, all from this duck feed. And they're, again, the seeds have worked their way into the cracks in the pavement and germinated been protected, uh, the roots have gone down and we've got some very interesting grasses, alien grasses growing up through there. Streams, ponds and lakes, the river saw, obviously at Alston Meadows, beautiful semi, uh, aquatic plants there to look at. Uh, and in Watermere Country Park, which is uh, completely artificial, unlike the river saw, uh, in the old gravel pits that were flooded, we have Dithander out now uh, along the saw and starting to colonize new areas. Um, it's a, 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 a fantastic plant to see in the uh, late uh, summer. Uh, the flowers along with, here with some uh, great hairy willow herb. Um, you can find it also in the Wildlife Trust's um, Cossington Meadows, not Cossington, uh, Cossington Meadows Reserve, and also in the reserve um, next to uh, Watermere Country Park. Woodland. I didn't think of there being woodland in the city, but there are. Oh, this is highway spinny and also foxhole spinny. Um, these are a lovely areas to go. There's plenty to see there. There's some nice wood sedge there and some celandines. Celandines again here along the edge of the stream. You can also find typical plants of old woodland. You can find um, Oxalis acetazella, the wood sorrel and Goldilocks Butterclub, Ranunculus auriconus. 
the, the sort of plants that you 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 that um, have been there for a very long time and are persisting quite well. You also find soft shield fir, which is increasing in Leicester, and wood sedge. This tells you that this piece of woodland is quite old. Um, it's been managed as a wood for a very long time. I, can, I gather that the wood in it was um, uh, used for coffins. Uh, it was owned by a local undertaker. So um, they, they were felled every now and again, it was taken out, and then they were left to grow. So the, a lot of the understory has managed to survive. So why is urban poverty important? Well, in England, 83% of people live in urban areas. Only 17% um, live in rural areas. So it's where most people live. That's why it's important. If we're going to talk to people about poverty and um, get them interested in plants, we've got to do it where they are. And lots of people won't go out to the tops of the mountains to see interesting plants. They won't go and stand in bogs or go to the coast. They may go to the coast, but for most of the time, it's on their doorstep and it's just trying to get people to see that this is what there is on your doorstep. You don't need to go a long way. You can find really interesting things just down the road. So the things we need to do really is to find out which plants are capable of living with us and understand how dynamic processes act on them. So how they, what moves them around, what causes them to grow, why are they changing? And we need to provide urban habitats for plants. Um, they can find out themselves, but if we give them the time, we can get a lot more and they'll be a lot more successful. Let's try to think, change the way we think. I mean, are urban areas really the problem or can they be part of the solution? There are some small scale and large scale solutions. And I'd just like to look at one at the moment. These are the sustainable urban drainage systems. Um, you can see these a lot now on new housing estates. Um, Areas are built for water to drain off. There's a, a gigantic one at Lubbisthorpe Way, just by the nature reserve. It's got lots of water to it. Um, the uh, M69 junction from the Ring Road and from Narborough Road. In winter, it looks a bit like this, um, which, you know, from a habitat point of view, is quite interesting. There's plenty of, of uh, open exposed mud there, some uh, interesting reeds that cover. In the summer, it looks like that. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, vegetation cover. Lots of uh, plants that produce a lot of seeds, so you get quite a lot of birds down there. And one plant you do find there is in abundance is this yellow marsh cress, Rorupa. Um, I don't think it was introduced there. It must have come in with birds, but it's spread massively. And it's one of the plants that I find very hard to find out in the countryside. Lots of marshland has been drained and there's, uh, this plant has disappeared. <clears throat> when I do find it, it's only in a small numbers, perhaps on the edge of a canal or a bit of a, a, a marsh area around a, a cattle trough or something. But here, there's a lot of it. And there's a lot of this other plant here, which is uh, marsh cudweed, uh, Nephalium religionosum. And it, so it's, it's proving uh, an area where plants which are having a lot of trouble surviving elsewhere can uh, move in and grow and become abundant. Why do, why do you want to do urban botany? Well, it's very easy. You don't need much transport. You can walk there, you can cycle there and get the bus. There's also a lot of places to park if you go by car. You don't have to worry about it. There's a lot of habitats to investigate. You can uh, follow the seasons. You can go uh, three or four times a year. It's not too difficult. House and see what's happening and you can learn a lot there's a lot of um, ecology going on there you can find out how plants are, are learning to live with us how they're learning to live with the environments we create for them and that's of course very satisfying and it's also a lot of fun so it's this is part this is the joy of urban botany you can you can you can it's easy you can learn a lot it's satisfying and it's fun now to so encourage you to get out, um, the New Year plant hunt goes ahead uh, this year and you, it runs from the 1st to the 4th of January and you can take part in it, um, the instructions on the website, but you must follow the current COVID guidance for your area. As you know, we're in tier four and so we need to apply that guidance. And you can, uh, the, the BSBR webpage, um, there's a, a different webpage devoted for, to it. 
and it'll tell you what to do, how to um, uh, record your results, how to send them in, and it'll also tell you the sort of contribution you're making to our understanding of um, phenology of plants. Okay, I think that's the end of my talk. <clears throat> so if anyone would like questions, I'd be happy to uh, answer some. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. Um, do you maybe put your video back on now. Um, so um, apologies uh, for the the sound quality. You were you were fading in and out a little bit, Jeffrey. But I think we got the gist of what you were saying. Um, uh, if if anybody missed anything crucial, I'm sure Jeffrey will be happy to uh, fill in the gaps. Uh, if there was anything that you you missed other than that if you if you want to ask a question you can either wave at me or put your hand up in the chat window or type it in the in the chat box if you're if you're a bit shy you're all thinking of questions I hope lots of people will be um, uh, the tier four COVID regulations, as I understand them, say that you're not allowed to leave your local area, uh, but that doesn't mean uh, you can't participate in the New Year plant hunt as long as you're uh, appropriately socially distanced and not meeting with more than one adult from outside your household. Um, Matt Hancock will correct me if I'm wrong about that. But um, well, Matt Hancock, well-known BSBI member. Um, <laughs> Frank, do you want to put your microphone on? Yes, uh, I, uh, I used to help look after highways in Leicestershire, highways, byways, footpaths and the like for <laughs> over 40 years. And uh, I spent a lot of my time trying to kill what we refer to as noxious weeds under the noxious <laughs> And uh, it just seemed to me that quite a few of these species, uh, I would almost put them into, the, into that same category. Certainly I wouldn't have a, 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 um, a grape hyacinth anywhere near my garden from the fact that it would absolutely take it over. So are any of these other species that are coming in likely to finish up on the, under the as noxious weeds? That's a, that's a good question. I, all I can say is we don't know, but I think a lot of them um, are exploiting niches that we create for them. So we are creating areas of discontinually disturbed land, of salted land, of land that's sprayed with herbicide. Um, so they're continually open in disturbed areas, continually disturbed soil. And that's what they like, that's what they, can, they grow. Um, as they grow and develop, they would change the nature of the soil in which they are, can change the nature of the habitat and they will most likely decline uh, most introduced species. Not all, but a lot of introduced species have a, a sort of expansion phase where they, they can take over a habitat, but then um, they start to decline because they can't compete um, in the end with other species which come in and uh, are native and can use the habitat much better than they can. So there is a potential, but I don't think we're in, a lot of these will head in for um, this you know Japanese knotweed situation. A lot of them are are ruderal plants. They they grow very quickly. They they seed. They they then um, uh, will remain dormant for a while and then grow again. Um, and they're not particularly particularly dangerous. Um, but uh, you know the, the, the if if we wanted to if we thought that the you know we are probably stuck with the um, Hailer fires on the sides of the roads because we're not going to stop sorting the road. We're going to continue to sort of roads in the winter. So they're going to, they're always going to be there and they're probably going to increase. And I expect we eventually will get more and more of those. Um, but that's because we've created that habitat. If we change the habitat, then, then they will disappear. Thank you. Um, so we've got we've got a couple of comments in the um, chat window. Um, uh, there's a, a comment from um, uh, Helen about um, uh, thanking you uh, and the BSBI for recording in the city of Leicester and Leicestershire um, to help to increase our knowledge because certainly I think it it is 
Ironically, it's not an over-recorded area botanically, which you might think it was. And there was a question from Jean about a pocket size uh, guide because she doesn't want to carry Stace around with her. And Louise has shared uh, a link in the chat window for the uh, BSBI list of uh, recommendations. Do you have, do you have a favorite, Jeffrey, that you would take out with you wandering around the streets? Um, favorite? That's difficult because I've got lots of favorites. I, th I think you should ask Louise. <laughs> these will be able to tell you. She's given us a whole list at bsbi.org slash get hyphen involved. So you can find a whole list of BSBI recommended books there. So uh, thanks for that one. Um, whether you'll get them, whether Amazon will get you with them in time for the New Year plant hunt, I, I don't know, maybe they will. Um, other booksellers are available. Yeah. I suppose really, I mean, the, you know, Francis Rose's guide is, is, is a meal. You can carry that if you've got a nice big pocket or a bag. I think Francis Rose Guide is good for beginners as well. Um, if you're a bit more advanced, then you can use Harrop's Wildflowers. That's another good one. Yep. Or you can use uh, the keys from Stace too, but they're, they're quite hard to get now. And they're more of a, a, a sort of specialist area. But Harrop's Wildflower and the Rose books are the, the ones that most people would use. Great, thanks. Uh, possibly got time for one more question if somebody wants to, uh, to ask anything. No, I think you've covered everything. You've, you've certainly given good <laughs> reasons to uh, go out and, and look at the pavements and these, 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 these areas of so-called waste ground, which, which aren't waste ground uh, at all, clearly. I mean, it was very noticeable to me when the council stopped spraying herbicides along the gutters and around the tree bases earlier this year. What a, what a dramatic flowering there was. And certainly there were, there were species that popped up that uh, you know, we've not seen before. And, and clearly they're there uh, and they're just suppressed by this uh, continual herbicide spraying. Um, so thanks, Jeffrey. Um, hopefully, as you said, this will encourage people to pay a bit more attention to what's around them and think that you, you don't have to go to Scotland to do any botany or do any recording or go to Norfolk. Uh, you can actually do it uh, in, in, well, of course, literally in your backyard, but also in your front yard as well and along the pavement. So thanks very much. Um, yeah, there's another very good comment from Helen that I'll have to echo the uh, Wild Places Guide um, on Nature Spot. If you're looking for somewhere to go, uh, as long as you follow the COVID regulations, uh, that will give you a list of places you can visit without traveling outside your local area. Um, so um, I think that's us for the evening. Um, can I just say that uh, this, is, this is the second time Jeffrey's done a presentation for us. His first one on ferns is available on YouTube. Uh, it's proved to be very popular. It's coming up towards a thousand views now, I think. Um, and we'll make this recording available too. Um, I, was, I was thinking this afternoon, um, what one thing I didn't anticipate on, the, 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 on New Year's Eve uh, 2019 is how much time I would be sitting in front of the computer this year. I'd never heard of Zoom at the time, um, and uh, it's certainly been one of the features of 2020 that none of us will forget in a hurry. Uh, good or bad, but I think there are some good bits. Uh, we've got some great presentations. We've had another one this evening. So thank you very much to everyone. And thank you again to Jeffrey. <laughs>